how to seek wisdom and the resultant benefits. This is Proverbs chapter 2. Okay, so this will be the theme that will flow through the whole of Proverbs chapter 2. If we finish it today, thanks be to God. If we don't, then this topic will remain here for some time as we break it down uh, by and by. By way of recap, I like to do that. We began uh, in chapter 1, if you recall, uh, the prologue which we began with, we saw how, what the purpose of Proverbs is, the writers, who, who is it who wrote Proverbs, the purpose of Proverbs. Then we looked at some of the themes of Proverbs, how to fear the Lord. You remember that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of, of wisdom. We saw that around verse 7 or thereabouts. Uh, from verse 1 to verse 6, we were seeing the reasons why Proverbs are there. Why are they written? Uh, who wrote them and why are they written? We saw that from verse 1 to 6. And then from verse, at verse 7, we saw the inception of, uh, of wisdom. Where does wisdom come from? How do, who, where is its foundation, its beginning? We saw it is a fear of God and we looked at what it is to fear God, didn't we? And then, if you remember, we then shifted from God and the next area we were in was listening to our parents, the wisdom of our parents. You remember that? Then we looked at the wisdom of our parents uh, in verse 8 and 9. Uh, and then uh, after verse 8 and 9, we were told there is also a danger in listening uh, to bad friends. The company we keep, who is your friend? Uh, who, who do you hang out with? Uh, who do you call to find out how they are doing? Who calls you to find out how you are doing? From that you can know what kind of uh, person you are. Eh? You say, show me your friends and I will show you what character you, you have. Isn't it? If the fellow, you, you, don't, you don't call anyone in church in the course of the week to find out how they are doing because they are not your friends. And none of the people in church also calls you to find out how you're doing. But the characters who call you to find out how you're doing, together with your wife and children, <laughs> are people who have nothing to do with Christ. In fact, they are the characters who have been wondering what you have to do with Christ. Eh? So those are the guys who call you, hi, buddy, how are you doing? And the kind of things that they can discuss with you are things that have nothing to do also with, with Christ or with God. There you are. So we're told... Who not to listen to? Then we reach that point when, because of the seriousness of the matter, Solomon personifies wisdom as a woman. You remember that part? So that the call of the woman, the voice of a mother, can be used to reach out to us, that we may see the need of wisdom. And I told you that wisdom in Greek is called Sophia. The word for the Greek word for wisdom is Sophia, and the Hebrew word for wisdom is Chokma. I bet this is where Hekima comes from. The word the Kiswahili word Hekima. This could be a root uh, word for it, Chokma. <clears throat> that is in Hebrew, and then in, in Greek, uh, the equivalent word for wisdom would be Sophia. Now, we saw how uh, wisdom then is personified as, as a lady, as a mother, to call to us. And we saw the importance of wisdom and the warning of those who forsake it. We saw that there was some very somber and solemn warning for rejecting wisdom. Because Wisdom, we learned, has time limits for approach. 
It is not open-ended. God cannot call you forever. There comes a time when the gospel will be shut. And friends, these things that we find in the Bible being taught to us, it is not that they have not happened in the history of biblical learning. Between the Old and the New Testament, there was a gap of how many years? Those who know. Huh? 400? Someone said 450? You said 450 years? Uh -huh. Someone said how many years? Someone said 20 years. 400 years between the last chronicle, which is really supposed to be the last book, the second chronicle, between that point and where you come to the coming of Christ in Genesis, in, uh, in Matthew, 400 years when God kept quiet and was, as it were, not communicating with humanity. 400 years. 400 years. Isn't that a fortest that it can stop? Isn't it a fortest? It is a fortest. You are being shown that God can actually decide to keep quiet and not commune with us, not communicate with us. So when the Bible says, when the proverb tells us that there is a time limit to approach wisdom, Surely we must take him seriously. We cannot pooza him and say, oh, he's just talking. God will always talk to us. Oh, the call of the gospel will always be there. How come it has not stopped for 2,000 years, over 2,000 years, really? We were told there was the solemn warning that the gospel can come to an end. The call to wisdom may be stopped. And we saw that it can also be stopped through death, didn't we? We ourselves who are being called may die before we, before we respond. So then there's the urgency of the gospel, if you ask me. But now as we come to chapter 2, after that introduction, we want to see how to seek wisdom. How does the proverbist tell us, tell us how, the way in which we are to to seek wisdom. Now, let us see what Solomon says to us in chapter 2 and verse 1. And I'm going to have us interact a lot with this um, study. My son, are you in Proverbs chapter one, chapter 2? Because from verse 1 to about 5, he tells us about the qualities of a diligent search. Eh? Qualities of a diligent or fervent, this is a fervent search. For wisdom. Verses 1 through 5. So let's bury our heads to it. My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you. Okay? I want you to focus on the word receive. Are you seeing that word? In the ESV it is receive. What does it mean to receive? Who receives something? Who, what, what is it to receive? What, what is another word for receiving? To get. Uh -huh. To accept. Yes, I think that's, that's closer. I think receiving is, is accepting, is it? Welcome. To welcome it, to welcome something, isn't it? Like receiving gifts, eh? To understand, much more to accept, to welcome, 
Any other synonym for receiving? It's welcoming, accepting, isn't it? Do you see, do you see, what do you see when, when, when someone welcomes you? What, what is his attitude as he welcomes you to, you come to visit me at my house and I say, I, I come to the door. You know, I don't just sit on my seat and you are knocking and I say, come in. Huh? Then I, I poke my nose inside and I find you with your leg on top of it. Eh? And you tell me, ah, come in. Now, there's another one, eh? I come to Peter's house. Peter Omiya, who is my friend. I go to visit him. And as I reach, uh, he hears my car outside. And what does he do? He comes to the door. And says, Brother Ken, you're here. Come in, come in, come in, brother. You know, he even ushers me in and comes from behind now. So we walk in and he's telling his wife, uh, Min Toto, come quickly. Elder is here. You see the differences. Is there a difference or is it just the same? One also said, welcome. He didn't. I went to visit first time. He did not tell me, go away. He said, come in. But his leg was on top of it. He did come to the door. Is there a difference? There is a difference. What is the difference? You have all said there is a difference. Everyone is nodding. What is it? Yeah? There is an attitude, a difference of attitude, isn't it? Which other difference do you see? In accepting, receiving me, what, what is the another difference apart from attitude? Yes. Uh -huh. One, there is some action accompanying the words. Eh? Another one, there is no action accompanying the words. You can see that one is more fervent, isn't it? One, one, is more, has, one has more willingness, isn't it, to have me. They are actually willing to have me, isn't it? Pastor also is willing to have me, but not as much as Peter. Peter is more willing to have me. That is the receiving, the, 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 the receiving which is here. The, the, the interpretation of this receiving, the word used here. It is a receiving which is willing, which is welcoming. You understand? That is what I want you to understand. That when he says, my son, if you receive my words, basically he's saying, if you are willing to accept it, if it is not being forced upon you, you yourself are willing to have it. You desire it. And so you accept it because you want it. It is not being forced down your throat. Th that is the receiving here. It is not receive of a war and those other characters. Where you are, you know you receive it, whether you like it or not. They pushed Ezekiel down for him to receive. Benihin pushed him down. He fell until his legs were up. If you see that clip, you'll see Ezekiel's leg went up. Because he fell on a chair. He was being told to receive by force. That is not the receive here. The receive here is the willingness. Alright? A willing receiving, which you go out for. If you receive my words, if you want wisdom, there should be A, a willing heart. There should be a willingness to receive it. If you receive my words and treasure my commandments, what is to treasure? Yes, Han. Uh huh. Treasure is something valuable. So what it is, what is it to treasure? Yes, Deacon. To highly esteem. To highly esteem. Yes, Peter. To take seriously. 
to take seriously. You treasure up those things that you highly esteem, isn't it? Those things that you think are serious, isn't it? Yes. To prioritize. Maybe I need to write those words. Prioritize. Take seriously. Highly esteem. Okay? If you are not only willing to receive it, but you are also willing to esteem it highly. You are willing to value it. To value wisdom. You know that when people are going to do exams, the way they read is different. Uh, speaking for myself, it's different from the way I read just a newspaper. When I'm reading my exams, I read differently. I read differently. Even when sleep wants to come over my eyes, I get up and walk with my book in my study so that I don't sleep. Because I don't want to sleep, I still want to read, though my body is tired. So I get up with my book. I do that often. And I stand by the window and read it. It must get in. There is no alternative. It, because the exams have to be done. So we cannot spare time for sleep. And if I see sleep is going, I go back and sit. And I tell my wife, bring cold water. And she brings some cold water into the study. So I can drink that cold water so that I don't sleep. Now, that is not how you read a newspaper. A newspaper, you can sit on your lounging chair Throw up your legs and read it. And if sleep catches you, much the better. Isn't it? Because that is what it was meant to be anyway. To relax your mind. It is time to unwind. Isn't it? Read politics and stories and then you sleep. And you'll be woken up. Dinner is ready. So because you've just been resting. That is not how to receive wisdom. Or how to search for it. This man is telling his son. The king is telling his son, King Solomon. My son, if you receive my words, if you're willing to accept it and you value it and you treasure up these commandments with you, there must be a willingness to be receptive to the words of wisdom, to treasure and highly value, therefore to remember those precepts. Not to just re receive them and forget them, but to remember them. The commands of wisdom. That is one of the tenets, one of the principles to be applied in the search for wisdom. A willingness to receive it. To take it as a priority. To take it seriously. To esteem it highly. Value it and constantly remember what God has said. The other principle we find in verse 2. What principle do you see in verse 2? In the search for wisdom. What quality? We have seen treasuring it, a willingness to have it. What do you see in verse 2? Attentiveness. It requires, brothers and sisters, it requires what I call serious engagement. Serious engagement. What pastor has said is attentiveness. 
The search for wisdom requires serious engagement. It is no child's play. Why is it no child's play? Why do you think it should not be, not, not be a child's play? The search for wisdom. Someone has had a guest. Yes, Mr. Yes. Yes. Uh, I was saying that if it is something you treasure mm -hmm. and you value as per our first point, mm -hmm. then you would not take it uh, just Likely, minutes. because it is something to be valued. Eh? But any other person can hazard a guess. Why? Yes, my sister. Then just give her this microphone. Because it's a matter of life and death. Ex now you've seen my notes. It is a matter of life and there is no other tougher reason. Life and death issue. That is what is in my notes. It is a matter of life and death. Life in heaven in the bosom of Abraham or death in hell with the rich man. That's where the division is. It requires serious engagement. Now, which parts of our body are we supposed to engage? Pardon? Yeah. Your ear, which means you have to listen, isn't it? It requires that we listen. Which other part? Heart. Which other part? Your mind. Uh -huh. Your will. Mm -hmm. You see those ones? Who doesn't see those things that we are writing in the Bible? In the blackboard? You've seen them. That is... That is how it requires. So then, friends, if this is how attentive we are supposed to be in the pursuit of wisdom, now I want to ask you something. What is the place of the person who comes to church? He woke up his wife if he has one and told her, make me breakfast. We are going to church and the wife dutifully made him breakfast or if he doesn't have one he made it himself and spruced himself up and then came to church and as soon as pastor stands at the pulpit and opens his mouth to pray he is sleeping or she is sleeping where, where is the place of that person in your own understanding in view of what we are discussing is that person pursuing wisdom? There's no serious engagement. You said it yourselves. Yes, brother. Media or scrolling through their gadgets. Now, you know, sometimes, sometimes. There is no need to come to church. Friends, there is no need to come to church if you are not willing to seriously engage with the word of God. That's my submission. There's no need. You should stay at home. Because if you don't, you know the problem with the Bible, what we have started getting scared of the Bible. And I pray you also get scared of it. There is a way in which as we approach God, if we don't seriously engage him, we pronounce judgment on ourselves. Now, I'm not cheating you. We do. Pastor, am I wrong? I don't want to mislead anyone. There is a way in which when we come before God, 
in a place where his word is being preached, and we decide of our own volition not to seriously engage with him, we pronounce a judgment on ourselves. We pronounce a judgment on ourselves. So then, it means, in this preparation to be serious, to engage, we must also do certain things in preparation. Especially the night before. Especially the night before coming to church. Could we sleep slightly early? So that we can get as much sleep as possible? And rest our bodies as much as possible? Could we avoid being cantankerous on that eve, the eve of, of the Lord's day? Avoid as much disputes as, you know, just to rest our minds and our hearts. Because we are human, isn't it? Aren't we humans? You know that when you have a lot of struggle and a lot of quarrels on the night before, when you come to church, honestly, you will not be sunk. Because you are only human. Is it possible that we could try our level best to avoid issues? When we were SDS, my mother would hate it to, to scold you on Friday. Tell you, you know that Sabbath order, and you are making problems so that I, I don't want to quarrel with you. And the, the Sabbath is, is being welcomed. You know, that we used to welcome Sabbath on Friday. Okay, that's how we used to welcome it. And there was sense in that. They may be wrong, but I tell you the truth some of those things when I reflect on them, I think they had sense. They, she did not want to quarrel with us. And the Sabbath is being welcomed, you know, on the Friday, on the eve of the Sabbath. And everyone wants to be at peace so that their minds are set to go and listen to the word of God. If we are to seriously engage, like what? And attentiveness. Because we know it is a life and death issue, then our ears should listen. And our hearts, and our mind, and our will should be focused on the word of God. Do anything that it takes to be awake when God's word is being preached. If some sleep is coming, get up. Get up. Go behind there, there is water. Wash your face, come back. But don't sit here and sleep. It is an affront even to the person who is preaching. Pastor has complained to me once or twice. How he has been discouraged and distracted to see some congregants literally sleep away through his sermon. Or do what Deacon was talking about. Engage with their phones and... and and, and social media and send messages back and forth. Friends, we pronounce judgments on ourselves if we do that. I use my phone during the service from where I sit there. Those who sit behind me know that I use my phone during the service. And I use it because I have a poor eyesight. Even sometimes when that thing is very bold, but because of light, I sometimes can barely see what is on the board. So those who sit behind me know that when I'm using my phone in the service, I raise it up high. And I use it for singing. And anyone who is behind me can see what I'm seeing. I don't go to social media. I use it for singing. Secondly, I use it for singing because sometimes these gentlemen here are slow at changing the slides. And when they are slow at changing the slides, it means the, the singing may stop. Now, since I have it on phone, I'll keep the tempo going, and anyone who is with me, we can continue to sing along as they continue to fidget and fix the problem that may, they may be having. But surely, I cannot come to church as your elder and start scrolling through my phone and sending messages of, hi, how are you this Sunday? That is not a serious engagement in the pursuit of wisdom. If wisdom be a matter of life and death, friends, 
then its pursuit must be for those who make their ear attentive to it and they incline their heart to its understanding. Yes, verse 3 says, if you call out, in other words, there is an engagement of the mouth as well, of the voice. Now, what do you think is the engagement of the mouth here? I said we are going to interact. What is the engagement of the mouth? What do you think the mouth there symbolizes? Not pastor. Anyone else? What does the mouth symbolize? Yes, brother. Prayer. If you pray to God for wisdom, you are listening to it being preached. But where you are sitting, every time he says a word, you are telling God, Oh, if that would fall into my heart. Oh, that your spirit would apply it to my own life. Not thinking as sometimes we do, that I wish my wife is listening. Because this part is for her. No, it is for you. It is for you. It is not for your wife. It is not for your husband. It is for you. You say, I wish... God, that the Spirit of God would apply that part that he has talked about to me. To sanctify me, to change me. To be more like your son. That is the part that I know I need. Friends, it requires a willingness to cry out for wisdom. Now, look at what he is saying. Yes, verse 3, I'm in verse 3, chapter 2. Yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding. Now, it is not a whisper, isn't it? The, 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 the idea there is, are you seeing a whisper? Uh, 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 it is a? What is there? A cry. What, uh -huh, a cry. Uh, what else is there, Steve? Huh? Raising your voice. What does what does raising voice mean? Fervency. What else? Shouting. Shouting. When people tell you don't raise your voice at me, what do they mean? You are shouting at them. You are telling your wife something, and then she tells you, "But honey, you don't have to raise your voice." She is basically telling you, "You could tell me without shouting." Eh? Children don't have to hear the neighbor is. Oblivious, you should not be hearing what we are talking. Just tell me. Isn't it? When do people shout? When is it necessary to shout? Let me put it that way. When they are annoyed? Yes, my sister. When there is danger. When there is need, isn't it? When something is far away, you shout, isn't it? For attention. Actually, my question was, when is it necessary to shout? Yes? When? Give this microphone. Mm -hmm. When you? I'm saying it's necessary to shout when you really want to get your message across. When you want to get a message across to yes. someone, yes. you want them to hear without mistaking it that you, you, you needed that thing, isn't it? Yes. That's when you shout. And like she said, when there is danger, you can shout for help, isn't it? Those are the points when shouting is acceptable. Right? You are standing here with Dikonemos outside the gate there, the parking here, and chatting away, and you can see a vehicle that has lost its brakes. Huko inakuja. Inakuja hapa na watoto wanacheza Will you keep quiet or will you shout the children, get out of the road? Isn't that necessary to shout? Why are you shouting? There is danger. You are trying to save a life if you may. Isn't it? So what do you do? You shout. Oh, you keep quiet and say, and you wait for the vehicle to roll over there. No, you don't do that. Don't you shout? And you shout that, and if there are adults, then you tell, help those children. 
Rush there, help those children. I can't cross the bridge myself. Help them. And if they are helped, someone will say, you know, it is someone in that church who shouted. Is when we knew there was a, there was danger. What do they say that later? They will say, we, we didn't know. Until a man shouted. Then we saw the danger approaching and we were able to hide from it. The writer of Proverbs says that those who are seeking wisdom, they are not only having a willingness to receive it or prioritizing it and taking it seriously and highly esteeming it or engaging seriously and being attentive to it, they actually cry out for it. They cry out for it. They cry out for it. What is your spiritual character in terms of prayer to God? In application. What do you pray to God about? What are some of the things you really shout to God to give you? The ones for which you really raise your voice. Until even you know that one, I've really been praying for it. Yeah? You can confidently tell that my husband has really been praying about that one. I have had him pray fervently. Or my wife has really been praying about this issue. In your prayer, does your prayer include a cry to God for help in matters of wisdom? In matters spiritual. Do you ever tell God to allow that the Spirit of God would unction and sanctify your, your life and keep you from the path of sin? And deliver you from evil? Those things that Christ said we should pray for. Isn't he the one who told us? Lead us not into temptation. In other words, he knows that God has the ability to sometimes avoid you walking the path of temptation. Where you could be tempted and you could fall. You could ask God. Now, sometimes we are tempted, we just realize we've been tempted. And we have not even been praying that we shouldn't be tempted. We say we are oteros. If we are tempted, we will overcome. Eh? You say, ah, but God has said, no temptation has overcome me, which is not common to man. I will just overcome. The same God tells you to pray, not to be tempted. You, one of the avenues of temptation, of dealing with temptation, is for us to be praying that we shouldn't be tempted in the first place. And that if we are tempted, may he deliver us from falling into him. Falling into sin. How many times in this past week, have you asked God to deal with that area in pursuit of wisdom, in pursuit of life? Chiri said it is life and death in pursuit of the life part of it. Look at verse 4. Someone read verse 4. Give someone, uh, give Steve that microphone. He will read for us verse 4. Verse 4 says, If you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures. If you seek it like? Silver. And search for it like what? Hidden treasures. How do people seek silver or hidden treasures? I think we will just deal, today we will just deal with verse one, one to five. Yes, how do people seek silver or hidden treasure? Give give uh, uh, Lillian the microphone. She has been seeking silver, <laughs> so she can tell us. Oh yes, with all their might and might. with all their mind and might. Aha. 
with all their might. With all their might. And with all their might. So there is attention again, eh? Because the mind is just attention, eh? Seriousness. These days, I don't think there are hidden treasures to be searched. I think people just seek silver. In those days, there was... These days, you can't even find a 10 bob on the ground. Have you noticed that these days, you can't pick money on the ground, eh? Which you mean in buy? At a pesa wa kudropiwa, hakuna. Wakati tukigroa hapu, ulikuwa unaweza kutembea ukienda shule, unapata 10 bob. Unaweka kwa mfuko. Unakuja nae nyumbani, unamambia mama yako, Bama, nilipata hii pesa. Anakuchapa. Ulipata wapi? Uliiba ya mtoto mungini. You say, I picked it on the ground. And you say, you have been good enough to even show. You, how many lived that life? Glory to God, isn't it? Thanks be to our mothers. That's the life I lived. You would be kind for everything and anything. Even for being honest. But that is besides the point. How many of you here are employed? In employment. Yes. These people are employed. You are employed. And you are not raising your hand. <laughs> How many are in business? I am in business. Yes. Yes. There are people who do business. And my sister and my wife and that gentleman. How many of you are in school studying? If you are in school and you are studying, raise up your hand. Those who are in school and study, okay, I will start with them. The ones who are in school and study. Why are you studying? Someone tell me why they are studying. Pardon? You guys are in school, you don't know why you are in school. Where is that microphone? Who has the microphone? Who is in school and studying? I, I want to know. Th those guys who raise up their hands. You have disappeared. <laughs> Jerry boy, you are in school, I know. Here, Jerry, come. Here, take, take the microphone. Why are you studying in school, Jerry boy? Why do you go to school? What do you hope school will help you with? Put it here. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, I go to school to, to be literate. To? To be literate. To be literate. Uh-huh. Yeah. And what do you think literacy will help you with? To understand things. I to know. understand things. Yeah. So the only reason Jerry goes to school is so that he can be sharp and understand. Any other person who goes to school? You go to school. Why do you go to school? I go to school to learn. Mm -hmm. And having learned... Uh, so that I may be able to pass it to others. He goes to school to learn so that he can be able to teach others. He is in Christ. He is studying theology. So his intention of going to the Christ school is so that he can learn the things there and be able to share it with others. Any other person who is going to school? Yes, Evans. I know you go to school. Yes. Why do you go to school, Evans? I go to school to gain knowledge and use that knowledge outside there maybe. When I'm em employed, I use that, the knowledge that I gained. To school. earn some income. Yes. So he is going to school to get knowledge. He will possibly pass his exams and then use that to look for a job so that he can get silver. You see, they don't want to say, but that is the aim. <laughs> These students who are going to school. The aim of going to school is not what Jerry is telling us. <laughs> that one of Jerry, wachia Jerry. Wachia Jerry. The reason they are going to school is so that they can acquire knowledge sufficient for them to pass exams, get papers with which they can be employed so that they can get silver. See how the road to getting silver is winding. That's what I wanted you to see. It starts from going to school. 
Little, little toddlers are being told, 20 children, 20 children. They, at that point, they don't know why they are going to school. But you, the parent, you know. You know that if you take Levin to school, as little as he is, he will go, 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 and go to university and become a doctor and a professor and, and all those big things, right? Then he will get a, a job. They are telling us these days having a bachelor's is useless. You must have a master's and a above. So that you can get a, a job. When you get a job, you can get silver and gold. You see how the road is winding? It requires determination. That is how to search for silver. There is a plan. You have to plan. There is a strategy. Made by yourself or others on your behalf to get silver. Silver does not come easy. You plan for it. You strategize for it. Isn't it? Yes. That is a time when you see that. Who knows someone who knows someone who knows Ruto's son? So that I can be his friend. So that we can get some silver. Who knows someone who knows someone who knows the PC? Or the governor, for that matter. These days there are no PCs, they are governors. So that we can get that fitness. So that we can get silver. That is the way to look for silver. It requires some effort. It requires a high estimation, a seeking, a searching. Now, let us come now to those who already have finished school and are working so that the students don't say to Likwa Tunawaleme, Tunawaleme. Those of you who are either in business or who are employed, how do you go about your business in front of your boss if you are employed? How do you do it? When the boss is around particularly. Eh? Is, is, is it when the boss is around is when you put up your phone and say, hey, Facebook, now, where, where? <laughs> Do you do that when the boss is around? You don't do that. Even if your boss is your buddy, that is not the time to say, hey, Facebook, yeah, well, this is Facebook. You know, this is WhatsApp, Instagram, and all those things, podcast. You don't do that. When the boss is around, what do you do? When your boss is around, what are you supposed to do? Yes, uh, Patrick, what tell us what he does? You do it diligently. You become very diligent, isn't it? So the boss can see that you are serious at the job, isn't it? If you don't do that, what would the boss likely do? You could be fired, eh? Because you are not serious enough. Or even your silver can come down. The silver that you've been getting per month can... It can be reduced. But if you are fervent and you are industrious at your work, what does the boss do? He increases the, the silver. You get more silver now. It's good, isn't it? If you can get more silver. And you come here to church and you tell us, thank God with me I've gotten a promotion. No one ever comes here to say, thank God with me I've gotten a demotion. I have not heard it, but it possibly doesn't happen. People don't praise God for their demotion, but they thank him fervently for their being appraised, being raised up. In other words, the search for wisdom, if you go by these things, it requires what English phrase calls an all out. Have you heard of that phrase? An all out approach. Hmm? You're giving it your all. Your mind, your soul, your heart, your strength. You're giving it your everything that you've got to get silver and gold.
Here is a simple test as we close. Whether you are in school, or whether you are in business, or whether you are employed. You yourself consider it in your own inside. Eh? Don't, don't, don't answer me. Don't answer. Just consider it. Have you worked as hard at seeking the wisdom of God? Even half as much as you seek to please your employer. Or as you seek to do your business. Or as you study for your exams. Have you worked as hard? Or even as half as hard in pursuing the wisdom of God as you seek to please your bosses, to do your business and get your silver? To study in school so that you can pass your exams? Have you worked even half as hard? Because God says through the writer of Proverbs. And if you want wisdom, it requires an all-out approach. And that is not strange. God actually says it expressly to the Israelites. And if they seek me with all their heart, if they love me with all their mind, with all their strength, with all their heart. Many times, we follow the things of the world with more fervency, with more favor, if you like, than we follow wisdom. The pursuit of wisdom is left for Sunday morning. It's when we come. But even when we come on Sunday morning to pursue wisdom, we pursue it half-heartedly. Oh boy, we sleep. As wisdom is dispensed, we, we, we drowse off. We fall off. Our attention wanes. We, we, we find ourselves falling drowsy and, and sleeping. Not so when we are on Facebook. We, we are attentive. We don't seem to fall off to sleep when we are on Facebook. Our attention is aroused. We, 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 we are awake. People who are scrolling on Facebook to get new information don't sleep. And they can be there on hours on end. But when the preaching is going on for 30 minutes and for, for 40 minutes and, and we start thinking, well, why is it going on for so long? This, this summons should be shortened. They should be shortened. Doesn't he know that we are tired? That is when people start coming up with their span of attentiveness, isn't it? There's a span of attention. You know, you, you, can't, you, you, you can only be attentive for 30 minutes. That, you know the human brain, huh? You've heard of those foolish things. Have you? I call them foolish things. Because they, have you noticed they only come up when the word of God. Any other thing, it's okay, isn't it, Pastor? It's okay. Oh, we may have been on Facebook forever. I didn't even realize time was going. But as soon as they start telling you that Jesus saves, that Jesus saves, you say this old, old boring story, yeah? Same, same story of Jesus. I wish they could mix it up. Now, charismatics have mixed it up for you. 
you can go there and get lost. They mix it up with all sorts of hu- uh, miracles and prophecies and useless stuff that doesn't come to pass that sends you to hell and jumping and dancing in no order because our God is a God of order. He wants our attentiveness, our fervence. Oh, that when we have finished preaching, we would find people meditating with tears in their eyes where they are sitting and the meditation is going on and they are saying, God, even me, don't leave me behind. Don't leave me behind. As you bless this, my friends, oh, bless me with your word. But what do we do instead? You know the the span, eh? the human brain can take in just so much. We think pastor is talking too, too much. He should he should narrow down those things into just one paragraph. And now we can go and meditate on that at home. You don't even go and meditate on it at home. And so every Sunday we tell people here after the service, as any time I'm given an opportunity to do a benediction, I say, friends, let's go meditate on this thing. Let's go think about it. Do you take time even to listen to Christian hymns, brothers and sisters? When it comes to Christian hymns, people have to rely on this thing to read it. But those, those doom to have things of... of they start singing like this, and someone is singing along. Me, I can't even understand whether, but they are singing along. They know the words. Every, the lyrics are right there. But the hymns taken from the Bible, we have some of them here years on end. We still have to rely on the board. If they, The moment the board stops, people keep quiet because they cannot sing Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found. Now I am found. Are we seeking wisdom in this way? These are the qualities of a diligent and fervent search for wisdom. You find them there. And look at verse 5 of chapter 2. Someone read for us verse 5. Someone take a microphone and read verse 5. Time is not on our, on our side. Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Exactly. We saw in verse 7. What was, read verse, verse chapter 1 verse 7. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. Chapter 1, verse 7. Chapter 1, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge which fools despise, isn't it? Now we read chapter 2, verse 5, and it says that if you search like this, then you will understand the fear of the Lord that we talked about in verse 7. Are we together? Because you could be asking, what is this fear of the Lord? The elder taught us, but I didn't understand. Now, if you want to understand it, search for wisdom like this. Then you will understand what it means to fear God. You will understand. Then you will find the knowledge of God. If you don't search it like this, you will not know what it means to fear God. You will not know. It will continue slipping. Slippery, yeah? Have you ever caught an eel? You know an eel? Come on, go. Very slimy. Try to catch it and it just slips. This knowledge would become slippery unless we search for it like this. 
with a willingness to receive it, to welcome it, prioritizing it, taking it seriously, highly esteeming it. We come to church with a mind where we are saying like that song we used to sing. Let's forget about ourselves and concentrate on him and worship him. How many people sang that song? Let's forget about ourselves and concentrate on him and worship him. Let's forget about ourselves and concentrate on him and worship him, the Lord Jesus. Did you sing that song? You come to the point where you say, Lord, help me now to forget about myself and the things that are around me and concentrate on, me, on him. Jesus, my Lord. If you search for him like that, you will find wisdom. I have to stop there. When we come back, we will look at, today we are looking at qualities of this diligent search as being taught by Solomon. When we come back, we will look at it as experienced by Christians. All right? So that's, that's the part we're looking at next. If you want to, go and read verses 1 and 5 again, then we'll come and, and look at it in that regard. Next week will be more of an application of what we have done. We will apply it even more. Because my hope then is that by, by the time we are through with this part, there should be a change of attitude. Better understanding, but also a change of attitude. So next week we are coming to change our attitudes. Right? So go and study verse 1 up to 5. If you have a study Bible, go and engage it. Or borrow one and engage the study Bibles. Verse 1 to 5. When we come, then before, after that is when we will look at the benefits.